We listen to music with our body, not our ears. You dance to music, you don't think about it. It hits your body and it makes it move. Whoever invented music, it's this incredible interaction between a player and then people hear it and it makes their body move. So it's almost like our bodies hear music. Like I, I feel like in order to really groove with a drummer, I almost picture that I have ears all over my arm, in my hips, you know, and so that music goes directly to your hips and you feel it and you move or to your arms and to your hands so that your hand playing the bass and grooving with a drummer, you're dancing. You're, you're dancing to the beat with your hand on the instrument and making a bass line, you know, <laughs> it's all dancing. Here we are with Chris Wood. Chris, man, so glad to have you here. So for everyone out there listening, uh, Chris is getting to go on, he's getting ready to go on tour with his band, the Wood Brothers, plays with his brother, but he's also well known for Medeski, Martin, and Wood. That's right. Um, so Chris, how are you, man? I'm great. I'm great. I'm, uh, I've just been farming all day, so that's why I'm, I've got my hat on, been outdoors, my hair is a mess, so I figured I'll just keep it right there. Um, yeah, things are good, man. Really, really happy. You know, the pandemic changed my life, and I ended up, uh, me and my wife got a farm, and, and uh, we're, we're growing food for the people when I'm not playing music. And it's kind of the antidote to the musician's life, you know, the touring mm -hmm. and spending hours on end in a studio. And here I get to be outdoors all day um, up in British Columbia and uh, it's just beautiful here and i never picked in a million years would thought i was going to end up in a place like this a living but um thanks to the craziness of the world i somehow i did the antidote i love that it is the antidote so <laughs> chris my, my first question here to start this off playing in the same band as your brother can you talk to me about like what you admire about him musically Oh my God, my brother is an incredibly soulful human being uh, and is a poet um, and has a phenomenal voice. Um, we both soaked up music, you know, certain roots kind of music. Um, he really focused on, you know, a lot of blues stuff, uh, Delta blues, Chicago, Texas blues. Um, I mean, he went to music school and he learned all kinds of stuff and he can, he could do anything, but I think the music that he really took the deep dive with was, was some real old school blues musicians, you know, um, Lightning Hopkins and, um, Muddy Waters and, uh, John Lee Hooker and Mississippi John Hurt, you know, like guys like that. And then like like anybody like so many bands that that are classic have, have taken that kind of music and then it filtered it through their own lens of who they are and it came out the other end with this unique you know way of interpreting and playing that music mixed in with who he is as a human being and um so uh, you know our our mother was a poet so there, there was always this fascination with words uh and and using language in these sort of concise mysterious ways to evoke a feeling to you know in the same way that Medeski Martin and Wood we always talked about how cool instrumental music was because it didn't have lyrics and that evoked kind of certain emotions that you can't express with words but poets get past that and they they can evoke mysterious emotions with words and you think about most people have a lot of songs that they love but if you really press them they don't know what the song's about but that gives them a feeling and so mm. i think that's pretty common you know more than we give credit to that, that sometimes we really i don't know there's some songs i don't really know what it's about but i know that i like it and it gives me a certain feeling and that's just because it's music you know and words are part of that how would you sum up your musical philosophy? Uh, well, God, that's a big question. My musical philosophy. Music, if anything, has taught me that um, 
nobody knows what makes music good. Nobody really knows what makes a song good, what makes a certain piece of music good, and it stays around forever. I mean, if we did, if there was some sort of formula, we'd be bored with it. And, you know, we'd just have a computer spit out classic, amazing music that we love that goes straight to our heart. But nobody really knows that, you know, and in hindsight, it's hard to realize that because there's so many classic pieces of music that were, we just take for granted. Of course, that's a masterpiece. Of course, that stood the test of time. But if you ask those artists, um, you know, like one that comes to mind is Ray Charles. I remember hearing an interview with him and he's talking about, you know, these songs of his that became hits uh, that still to this day resonate with people. He didn't know. He just figured or hoped that every song he was writing would become a hit. It wasn't like he chose like, oh, this is the one that's going to resonate with most humans on the planet. And this one's going to probably be forgotten about. Like, of course, he wants every song to be one of those classic songs. And so even a master like that didn't really know truly what was going to end up good, what was going to end up bad or mediocre or forgettable. You know, it's like Mozart and Salieri. It's like, you know, who knows? Maybe certain freaky geniuses know. Maybe Mozart knew that his music was classic and everyone would listen to it forever, you know. But um People at the time didn't, you know, and his peers didn't. So for me, music is, is a complete mystery. And that's why it's always interesting. It's uh, this endless process of trial and error and experimentation. Um, and so over the years, you constantly learn this and often the hard way, you know, um, it always surprises you like we just finished working on the next Wood Brothers record. And once again, this happens every single time, you know, we, we, we have a song we're trying to record. Maybe we do go in there, we do a couple takes and all of us are like, Oh yeah, that last take was that, that really felt like something that was really good. And then we go into the booth and we listen to both of them. And the first one is better. And we, none of us can explain exactly why we just know that the second that first note hit, it's like, wow, there's something about this one. It's classic, it's the feel, it's the way we're all approaching our instruments. It's maybe the fact that we actually are not confident about the song yet. Like once we got confident because we played it a few times, everyone, you know, they get a little cocky and they dig in a little bit too hard. You know, they get a little too sure of themselves. So instead of listening and reacting to what's actually happening, if you play a song, a lot of times you start to get this idea in your head, like, oh, here's how it should be. But then you stop listening. So the magic is in that complete presence. That's when the good shit happens, right? And um, it's such a, it takes years and years. So maybe some people magically or geniuses have, have or tapped into that and understand that right away. But for most of us, it takes years of realizing that when we feel something was good, we actually don't know that. And once when, when we listen back, it happens in concerts too, like live concerts when I thought that concert was amazing. And I listen back to it. I'm like, I don't know, we're all rushing and a little too excited. And, and then there might be another concert where I'm like, ah, I just felt off on that one. And then you listen back and there was this certain mysterious magic about it that made it better. So we just don't know. So. All you're left with, once you accept this conundrum, that you're not in control of good and bad. I mean, yeah, it's good to work hard. It's good to practice. All that stuff is fine. But in the end, when you're actually creating music and the actual creative act, you're not in control of good and bad. So you have to surrender to that. And instead of working on being good or what you think is good, you work on being present. And that's, that's, it's like that razor's edge that they talk about in Buddhism or Zen or whatever, you know, that razor's edge of awareness where you are just receiving information. So in the case of music, you're receiving the sound, whether it's the drum beat or what the guitar player is doing. And you have to work on trusting yourself and trusting that with all the practice that you've done over the years, 
that without thinking your body can appropriately react and do something better than what you consciously preconceive. Mm. So it's, it's sort of, it's not that dissimilar to like, uh, one time I got stung by a hornet, but I didn't know it until I'd finished running to the top of the hill as fast as I could away from the hornet's nest. Like my body reacted, it bypassed my conscious mind. You know, this is, our body has this fight or flight thing that bypasses your cerebral cortex, right? Because it's really great for survival. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's kind of like in the same way that you trust that your body knows what to do in, in danger and you don't have to spend even a microsecond thinking about it. If you work on it in music, eventually you can build that trust with yourself that if you only listen, you will react appropriately and play music as best as it can be. Mm. So easier said than done. And the hardest part about that is to remember to remember to do it, <laughs> right? Because we're so programmed in this culture to, to try harder, to think ourselves using you know our sort of our conscious mind to be better at something and that's really useful to a point but there's a point where it doesn't do you any good and actually gets in your way so and that's at the point where you have to start building that deeper trust with yourself you know and so it, you kind of have to do that you have to really be um brave enough to suck for, for a minute you know because <laughs> So, so what, how, when I, when I like teach about this stuff, it really comes down to this. Like if, if you picture like one of those magical nights where the music really was special and it was so on that even you knew it while it was happening. Occasionally that happens where it's just like some deep part of you realizes, okay, everything's at another level tonight. If you really meditate on that and think, well, what is, what's going on in your body and your mind and it's some really basic stuff, you know, like, like breathing. It's the breathing is foundational, but we, whenever we're doing something that we think of as difficult, we stop breathing, you know? So, so a very simple example of what I'm talking about is if you take something on your instrument that you're still trying to get better at that, you know, is a little challenging for you. And while you're doing it, whether it's a scale, a rhythm or whatever, you focus on your breathing and you prioritize your breathing so that you allow this to, to not be correct until your breathing is very steady and natural and in and out, right? And it sounds so simple, but you'd be amazed at how many things that you think you're pretty good at on your instrument, you actually have difficulty doing when you just allow yourself to focus on your breathing. It's a, it's, it sounds so foundational and simple, but everybody at every level, even professional musicians, it's, um, I think you, we're often surprised that like, oh, I guess I don't really have that piece of music under my fingers because I'm having a hard time just breathing naturally while I play it. So in order to do that, you have to prioritize your breathing over playing correctly until the breathing becomes natural, so natural, so in your body, so relaxed that then your mind without having even a shadow of a doubt that you're gonna like start doing weird things like holding your breath and, you know, that then you can just shift your awareness onto your hand and start playing correctly, whatever you're working on, without ever for a second sacrificing the breath. So it's, it's that's the kind of thing that we, we always, we're so concerned about being good in our culture at the thing that we wanna be good at that we sacrifice the actual way our body needs to exist in order to be truly good at that skill. So it's a little bit, at first it's counterintuitive. It's like, I'm gonna prioritize my breathing over and then I'm gonna suck over here until I get my breathing together. And as, when that really comes together, then I can breathe naturally and play correctly at the same time. So. And it's the same thing. Then you can go into your body and have the same thing. Well, I'm going to prioritize. Uh, many teachers call it being relaxed. You know, it, all, so many music teachers, relax, relax your body, you know, which is very important. But um, 
I think of it as more like being still. You want to be absolutely still in your body so that you can react, you know, like in martial arts, like you have to be so centered, literally centered over your feet so that you can, in a, in a moment's notice, move in any direction, right, left, that way, that way, or your hand has to go up, has to go down, you know, whatever it needs to do to react instantly to the music or to whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to literally be centered and be still, all your muscles are still, only using what's absolutely necessary to, to do, play the music or sing the note if you're a singer, you know. It's so we, we tense up all these unnecessary muscles when we sing because we're insecure, you know. <laughs> So again, you have to prioritize relaxing over being good. And it's like, all right, I'm going to sound terrible for a minute while I prioritize being relaxed, being still in my body, my breathing, until I get that together. And then, oh, the singing becomes easier. Ah. So, yeah, it's like all about how you say it more so than what you say kind of thing. You know, the song, uh, uh, it's not what you look like when you're doing what you're doing. It's what you're doing when you're doing what you look like you're doing. <laughs> it's that. I like that. I like that. I don't know that song, but I, I oh, it's a classic, classic that song. So while I have you here, I want to talk about rhythmic inspiration. You are someone mm. that, you know, you draw from Latin music, um, different kinds of African music, I'm sure, and, and stuff that I probably do not even have awareness of of its existence different schools of music if i if i use that word schools loosely um yeah but can you can you talk to me about what you most admire about um some of your rhythmic influences and and really what you think it is about rhythm that can be just so profound and moving um to the listener to the player yeah um and even like how the room and the acoustics of the room, what part that plays in it? All of music is, is the, the roots of it is rhythm. Even, you know, music that doesn't feel rhythmic, a phrase, even a melodic phrase, like it's that you might hear in an orchestra where, yeah, there's no beat, there's no grid of time going by, but it's still a phrase that has a beginning and a middle and an ending and has an arc to it. That's rhythm. And all the counterpoint that happens against that melody or whatever it is, that phrase, all that is rhythm. The form of a piece of music, whether it's 12 bar blues, an AABA song form, uh, or you know, a waltz or something, the form, the length of sort of what we call one time through the chorus in music, you know, that is a rhythm. So everything is rhythm. All music comes from rhythm. Uh, in Western culture, we, we, I think wrongly prioritize harmony, you know, uh, music theory, you know, harmony and, and chordal stuff and just learning that. Um, but I think cultures who begin with rhythm, you know, and require anybody who wants to play music to play some sort of percussion instrument first, are light years ahead of us, you know, in, in terms of when they switch to and start learning about harmony, um, they have this incredible facility already there because they, they understand and can feel rhythm, whether it's one little, uh, you know, one bar rhythmic phrase or, you know, like what a four bars phrase feels like or in Indian music, you know, you have crazy long, very long, uh, phrases of music, but but they are learned by really learning rhythm, studying rhythm, and then you're able to feel the arc of a phrase. So even though you're singing a melody and and um, it's not necessarily always in a grid, it's that's all rhythm, you know. So it's just so foundational. It's like I can't say that enough. And um, I know I made the mistake, like most you know, kids and Western culture who were excited about music and want to learn it. I got really excited about jazz. I wanted to learn jazz. And I had the classic uh, Miles Davis record, Kind of Blue, right? Which most people on the planet have heard by now. And Kind of Blue, you know, has like Cannonball Adderley and John Coltrane and Paul Chambers and Wynton Kelly and Bill Evans and these incredible players. Every 
solo and of course Miles Davis and every solo is classic like almost like a written melody you know it's so beautiful and so I one day as sort of an ambitious uh young jazzer was like well I'm gonna figure this out I'm gonna figure out why these guys know how to pick the good notes and why they're you know they sound so good like why are these solos so good and so I got one of those machines where it was like the old tape cassette machine where you could slow it down to half speed, you know, so I could like transcribe every single note. And I, I wrote every single note down that these guys played. And it just took hours and hours, hours, a lot of work. And I had the chords and I had exactly what notes they played against the chords. And I started studying those notes. And I quickly realized that there's kind of nothing special about the notes. They're just playing you know, some chord tones. And they would sometimes use chromatic runs to get from one chord tone to another chord tone. And it didn't really teach me anything, but it made me realize that, oh, okay. So it's not the notes. That's not the part that matters. It's their rhythmic phrasing. So if you study like a Charlie Parker thing, you look at his notes. I mean, yeah, there's some interesting things that he does the way he dances around uh, chord tones. And, and he might choose a few unexpected notes here and there, but what really makes it speak is his rhythmic phrasing. So I started, you know, experimenting with things like, um, well, what if you took, you know, if, if we use the Charlie Parker example, like the song Donna Lee, like all jazzers know the song Donna Lee, Jaco Pastorius made it very famous by doing the solo rendition with Kungas, it's unbelievable. Um, but if you really want to understand Donna Lee rhythmically, you know, it's harmonically, it's one thing. It's harmonically complex and interesting and fun to study. But what's also fun, then, if you really want to get good at the, the way that melody dances over the chord tones of the form of the song, you can play Donna Lee, the rhythm, but get rid of Charlie Parker's notes. So if you've heard the song, it's like one, two, right? That's the first phrase. So, well, oh, okay. What if I use that rhythm, but I make up my own notes? So, you know, and just experiment with like, oh, can, can the rhythm, and again, like I talked about the breath earlier, like let's prioritize the breath over the correct playing here. This, you can do the same thing with rhythms. Like I'm going to prioritize the rhythm. And even if I'm flubbing the notes, I'm going to make that the priority with my fingers that I'm going to at least get that rhythm right. And once I get comfortable with that rhythm, it's really sinks into my body. Like I can dance it. Then I can have fun improvising my own notes, but using Charlie Parker's rhythm. And that's how you learn to feel like Charlie Parker. You know, mm. and like you kind of learn how to get in a skin a little bit because you, you, you get his rhythm in your body. You know, it really helps if you listen to one of his records, too, instead of just reading it off the page, because you can really you can feel the way he dances that rhythm with the saxophone. You know, so it, that has to be like a, an audible learning thing. So we listen to music with our body, not our ears. Mm. You know, that's what dancing is. You dance to music you don't think about it. It hits your body and it makes it move. That's another mis mystery about music. And it goes back thousands and thousands and millions of years probably, right? Like whenever, whoever invented music, it's this incredible interaction between a player and then people hear it and it makes their body move. Why is that? I don't know, but it's really an amazing thing. So it's almost like our bodies hear music. Like I, I feel like in order to really groove with a drummer, I almost picture that I have ears all over my arm in my hips, you know, and so that music goes directly to your hips and you feel it and you move or to your arms and to your hands so that your hand playing the bass and grooving with a drummer, you're dancing, you're, you're dancing to the beat with your hand on the instrument and making a bass line, you know, <laughs> it's all dancing. I love that. I want to talk to you lastly about, group improvisation you know all your years of that especially touring the country doing that um what have you learned about properly maintaining um the group dynamics to have a really really great improvisational group 
bands are incredible things. They're like these wild social experiments. You know, you get like a, a group of people who are attracted to each other for whatever reason, you know, musically, and they just like they have a chemistry. And it's like, I want to make music with you guys. And, you know, let's start a band. And next thing you know, you're living together, you're traveling together, you're eating together, you're doing business together. So it's like, it's way bigger than just the music. So, and you quickly realize that everybody in the band has strengths and they have weaknesses. And if you learn to respect them all and everyone respects each other's and realize, okay, I'm not so good at this, but he's really good at that. And, but I'm good at this. So I'm going to, and quickly everyone falls into these roles and, uh, you know, if bands don't work out, it's probably because someone feels bitterness about their role. It's like, well, I want a bigger role than that. I want something different. But, you know, but if you can respect the natural place where you end up and inhabit your role and, and surrender to your weaknesses and your strengths and grow from there and nurture the dynamic in the band, you know, so it's so much bigger than just what you do when you're all having your instruments together. Um, but ultimately when you're playing and if you can bring that love and respect into the playing um, and leave the conscious thinking behind and really uh, are able to trust and, and then it just becomes this beautiful, uh, playful, trust thing <laughs> where you know where all you're doing is listening so and this this takes time to learn because we all are easily you know if, if you're good at if you want to be good at music and you work really hard at it inevitably you're going to get judgmental about how other people play it's just built into the process so okay that's fine and you know like but um eventually people's imperfections about the way they play sometimes are what make their, them, them unique and, and make their voice magical. So when you get to a certain level, you start realizing that the imperfections actually have a beauty to them. And instead of fighting them, you can just listen to them and react to them and surround them with your contribution musically that actually makes the imperfections beautiful, like the best part of the music. You know, um, so this can happen a lot with like like tempos. You know, people sometimes really have a tug of war with tempos and you know how to feel a song. And um, there's really no right or wrong. You know, and I think it's easy to get into this trap of like, well, that music is. You know, some people think it has to be metronomic, and, and that's correct. And anything that's not you know, lined up with a metronome is incorrect, but music is very organic. I mean, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be metronomic and often it's um, more magical when it's not. So there's a give and take and a trust with your band members. Um, when I, so, you know, Billy Martin from Modesky Martin and Wood, he created this great uh, rhythmic uh, style. He put out a book, a great drumming book. Uh, but it's for anybody. It's not just for drummers. It's really just a book about rhythm and it's called rhythm spelled R Y D I M. I think, you know, it's just his unique notation. He came up with to, to make rhythm. It's very simple. Just an X for a, a, a hit and a dot for a space, you know? So if you, you know, played something like it would just be X dot, X dot, X dot, like hit space, hit space, hit space, right? So he made up this very simple, almost childlike notation for rhythm that's beautiful. It looks beautiful too. And then he would create groupings of uh, rhythms that go together. So they're basically like polyrhythms, like, like things you might hear in African music or, you know, like kinds of Latin music, Brazilian music. Um, it's like a rhythmic language and like the way he put it, it's literally rhythmic harmony. Like in the same way that you have a chord on the piano, let's say, and you have the root and the third and the fifth and the seventh and the ninth and whatever, he would create uh, rhythms that go together the same way a chord puts notes together, right? So 
you know, might have a rhythm like which sounds like so many African based musics, you know, you think of New Orleans second line music and Brazilian music has that rhythm, all kinds of Latin music and then African music, you know, it, it came from Africa. That's where that rhythm comes from. And then along with that rhythm, you might have a all those rhythms, if you start playing them all at the same time, they lock in together and the, the hits and the spaces create this beautiful counterpoint that you can hear and, and a lot of this um, rhythmic folk music from Africa and from you know the Latin countries and, and Brazil, et cetera. But the cool thing that we learned when we would play these together with MMW, sometimes we, you know, you sit there and we play these little uh, rhythmic pieces that he created. What you quickly learn is that there's no right and wrong in tempo. Um, and these things fit together, these rhythms fit together like this. So as long as you're listening, not to yourself, but to the other people playing, they may be playing a little slower, a little sloppier than you. But if you listen to them, you can still lock in and still create the rhythmic puzzle, you know, in the counterpoint. And, and, and flow with them and adapt to the way they're doing it instead of being rigid and saying the my way is the right way but as soon as you do that then you you get off and nothing's grooving anymore but if you if you surrender a little bit to the way they do it and learn how to lock in you can elevate everything because then they hear you and they start feeling it better and suddenly this starts happening and then all of a sudden you're all on the same page and beautiful things happen from there. But if you fight it right from the beginning and you say, you know, this is right and this is wrong and my way is the right way and it's hard to really get anywhere. So it almost goes back to the thing I said earlier. It's like you kind of have to make that the priority and be unafraid to suck briefly <laughs> or make a mistake in the short term for something much more beautiful to happen in the longer term. Mm. Chris, I love it, man. Thank you. Um, big lessons here. Definitely, they apply beyond just music. Uh, Absolutely. Chris Mann, yeah. Thank you for the time. Everyone out there listening, there's some tour dates. We're going to have in the description a link. The Wood Brothers going on tour with Guster. Chris, man, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, if you made it this far, thank you for tuning in. Big shout out to our sponsor, Thrax. Check them out if you're looking for some incredibly high quality CBD and THC gummies. Also, big shout out to J&J &J Distribution. Retailers, check out their brands, Kush Burst, Death by Gummy Bears, and Compassionate Buds. Also, big shout out to SEM Tickets. If you're throwing events and you're looking for a reliable ticketing source that's well-priced, look no further. Got links in the description. Much love, y'all.